How are you, sir? How can I help you today? I am really stressed out with my family, and it is complete chaos at my house, and I need something to take. You're in luck. Just got something in today. It's called Families. Take two of these, and your worries will melt away. Wow. Families. Mmm. One of the things us pastors do is we like to talk shop. You know, you get two oil field guys together, they start talking shop, or two doctors together talking shop. Same thing for pastors. And I've got friends that have moved from all over different parts of the country to Texas. And of course, I've grown up here, so I know the culture and stuff, and we'll talk about things or whatever. And I was asking one of them one time, I said, what's the biggest kind of culture shock you've got from coming where you were to where you are today to here? And they said, you know what? It's the Texas yes drives us nuts. I'm like, the Texas yes. What do you mean the Texas yes? He said, well, you're here in the South, especially in Texas. Haven't seen anywhere else. But, but you know what? You, will, you people will agree to anything. I mean, if I ask you to do something or say something, or do it, you'll, oh, yeah, I'll be there. Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, I'll show. Oh, yeah, I can help you with that. And so you expect them to show up, and they never do. He said, it drives me nuts. He said, there's one guy, and I've heard several different friends of mine tell versions of this that has happened to them. This one, it was hilarious. He said, this one guy was his neighbor. And he had asked, and they'd been talking about church. Oh, you're a pastor? Yeah. Oh, he said, I'm a, I need to come check out your church sometime. And the guy said, well, you know, how about, how about this weekend? The guy goes, yeah, I'll, I'll be there this Sunday. I'll see you this Sunday. He said, okay, great. So he got home, and he realized, oh, darn, I'm not teaching this weekend. But, well, it's church is church or whatever. So he said, you know what, I know what? I'll just go by a little later than I normally leave, and I'll swing by, and I'll pick him up. So anyway, he goes, pulls up in front of, you know, pulls up in front of the house, goes, knocks on the door, knock, knock, knock. You know, it's. No answer. Knock, 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 knock. He sees the peephole. There's light in the peephole. The peephole goes dark. Peephole quickly goes light again. They're in there. Okay. Knock, 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 knock. Nothing. He looks down. And there on the front porch is a fishing pole and a tackle box and a cooler. Okay. Well, he takes the lawn chair, one of the chairs, pulls it up and just says, he goes, I don't have to be at church today. So he sits down right below the peephole and just sits there and waits and of course about 30 minutes later the guy opens the door and there's the pastor standing there's like ah he's like so you ready for church uh uh well uh, you know i said well you he goes you said you're gonna go you said this week you were coming here i am let's go well i uh i kind of I've, you know i got a fishing trip said, so hey, you told me you're gonna come to church but you had a fishing trip planned you, well yeah i mean you know but I, I, well I, i'll be there next weekend he's went right that neighbor doesn't talk to him anymore for some reason he can't figure it out just you know won't even make eye contact with him but it's the texas yes and that's a problem i mean it's like sometimes it's like we need sodium pentothal with people to know if they're telling us the truth it's like hey man you know next week i'm moving can you help me hey no problem man i will be there to help you move are you sure you're gonna make it oh man i can make it what are you putting in that syringe? Hold still for a minute. Okay, are you going to be there to help me move next week? I have no intention of helping you move next week. I'm going hunting. I'm just saying this to be nice. Oh, great. You know, isn't it, doesn't it stink that we need that? Doesn't it stink that sometimes we're the one that needs the injection to tell the truth? That's what we're going to look at today. Our problem with telling the truth of doing what we say we're going to do when we say we're going to do it. So let's jump pray and then let's jump in. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for this opportunity. We, we have to look into it. And as we say, to, to try to be better today than yesterday, better tomorrow than today. Because the purpose of your word isn't just to be looked at and read and oh, but it's, it's not just a book on a shelf. It's a recipe, a prescription for living our lives each day. Father, today I pray you give all of us steel toe boots because today, as well as I went through this this week, my toes got stepped on. And I have a funny feeling as, as we talk today, 
Some people's toes are going to get stepped on. But that's what your word does. It convicts us and shows us how we, what we're doing wrong and what we need to be doing to live right. To live right and with our fellow man and to live right with you. So, Father, today I pray you open our hearts and our minds to what you'd have us here and help our feet go out and actually do it this week. And it's your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, pull out your notes. You have a note sheet that God came in your bulletin. You can follow along. The verses are on it. If you've got your Bible, of course, always use that. We also have, if you've got an a iPad or an iPhone or an Android or any of these phones that have apps on it, and you've got the U version of the Bible on your phone, you can go to that and on the go to the menu and on live, there's a little button that says live for like live events. Click on live and when it says search, just type the word renegade in and today's notes will appear on your phone, on your Android or whatever. Just something cool we're doing now. So I don't mind if you know you've got your phone out or your iPad out during church. Just as long as I don't hear a bird go, hey yeah that's what it's saying. <laughs> Not gonna go there. But follow along with us. Here's the issue, you know. We've got to be people of our word. And that's the key. We have got to be people of our word. We've got to do what we say we're going to do when we say we're going to do it. And that is a problem in our society. In fact, that's a problem now, it seems like, throughout the world. I was reading uh, years ago, just several centuries ago, your handshake was your bond. If you told somebody you were going to do something, it was a handshake. And that was it. Enough said it was going to be happening. Business deals didn't take lawyers and contracts and negotiations. It was, you're going to do this, I'm going to do this, and we're going to do it by this date. A deal, deal. That's it. That's all it took was a word and a handshake. I was reading a story on the Canadian-U.S. border. Trappers, they used to have a thing called jawbone credit. And I guess it was because you talk with your jaw and it was basically you gave your word and you got credit. I read the story about this trapper. It's 1878, and there was a merchant, Bozeman, Montana. And this trapper named Andrew Garcia basically went in, and the merchant gave him jawbone credit, gave him $300 worth of supplies so he could go from Montana, go up into the mountains, and go trapping. And Andrew agreed that basically as when the season was over with, that he would come back and he would repay the merchant in... In, in hides and furs. It was, a, it was a handshake, gave it to him, and that was it. I mean, this guy was going up into the mountains for the, for the winter to trap. That's the spring to trap. That's what he was doing. How many of us would do that today? How many of you would give somebody, what, at $300 in? That's like $3,000. How many of you would give some stranger $3,000 loan just on a handshake? We wouldn't do that today. That's what that merchant in Bozeman did. Gave the guy basically $3,000 in today's money worth of supplies, sent him off in the mountains with a promise that when the trapping season was over, he'd come back. That was it. But today we don't. We need contracts. We need lawyers. We need notaries. We need signatures. We need signatures and duplicate. You ever sell a house? My gosh, your hand gets cramped from signing all the things and the disclosures and the title and this and that and the other thing. You have title insurance to make sure that, you know, that you really own it. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous what we have to do. And the problem is, is why do we have to do that? Because so many people make promises they can't keep. So many people give their word and don't keep it. That's the first thing. Being someone of our word, don't make promises you don't intend or don't think you can keep. If you can't do it or follow through, don't promise it. Don't say you're going to do something if in the back of your head, you know there's a pretty good chance you're never going to follow through. That's the problem of our society today. Everybody makes promises they can't or have no intention of keeping. Look what Matthew chapter 5, picking up verse 33 says. Open your Bibles, follow along. Or like I said, note, screen, it's there for you. Matthew 5, 33. And this is Jesus talking. It's part of the Sermon on the Mount. And he's saying, again, you have heard it said of those to old, you shall not swear falsely but you shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair black or white. Now what Jesus was talking about here was oaths. 
you have heard it say to the old, you shall not swear falsely, but perform your oaths to the Lord. Now, a lot of people look at that verse and they go, oh, well, see, Jesus is saying you don't make oaths. You don't make promises. You don't swear to anything. You, just, you know, that's why some people, they won't go to court and put their hand on a Bible. They won't take an oath because the scripture says you don't take oaths. That's not what it's saying because over and over in the Old Testament, there was prescriptions and lists and rules on what you did when you made an oath. In the New Testament, after Jesus spoke this, you still see Paul taking oaths and basically saying, in God's name, I promise you, or whatever. So we're not talking, it doesn't mean not to oath. What Jesus is talking about is how people were giving oaths, how people were making promises, how they were going about it. Now an oath, the Greek is horkos, and it means that which has been pledged or promised. Well, you can't go through life without promising somebody something. You can't go through life without pledging somebody something somebody you can't go through life without giving your word i mean the mere fact that you tell somebody if they say, say see you tomorrow or you make a lunch appointment that's giving your word you're selling somebody hey i will be there what we're gonna do lunch on friday great noon i will see you there you've given your word that is in essence a promise that's what an oath is a promise in ancient time in jesus day oaths were serious things because when you took an oath what you did was you sweared by your God, by your deity, what you believed in. And what you were saying when you took an oath, like in a business deal or something, I, you know, I pledge in the Lord's name that I will pay you back by Yom Kippur. You were taking an oath, and what you were doing is you were basically saying, I am giving you a promise. And if I renege on my a word, may my God strike me dead and take vengeance on me. That's what you were saying. That's how serious the oath was. But what was happening in Jesus' day is that there was oath abuse. And the rabbis had kind of taught that, you know, well, if you swear by God or by the Lord, then you have to keep it. But if you swear by something else, eh, you can break it if you want to. So people were swearing by odd things. They were swearing by, by heaven. I, you know, as heaven is my witness, not God, as heaven is my witness, or, as I stand on the earth, I promise you. Or, by the hairs on my head. And what Jesus was saying is, you're taking these oaths thinking, well, I'm making a promise, but I don't have to keep it. And what Jesus is saying is, look, if you give your word, it doesn't be swear. It's not because you make this big proclamation. If you say you're going to do something, do something. If you think you're getting away with it because you're making this oath or this promise on something not of God, basically what Jesus is saying is this. He says, look. Look, you can't swear by heaven because that's where God thro God's throne is. God created it. So if you swear by heaven, you're swearing by God. And you can't swear by the earth because that is God's footstool. And God created that. It is part of his creation. Therefore, if you're swearing by God's creation, you're making a promise to God. And you can't do it by the hairs on your head because you don't have the power to turn one of them black or white. Well, maybe it was Claire all, but that's beside the point. But basically, you can't just go, hair, be white, you know. I wish I could still go, hair, be black. It just doesn't work. The gray just keeps coming. But he's saying that you don't have any power over that. I created that too. So if you swear by any of these things, you're still making an oath. You're still promising by me. And that's the other thing. The, the next thing that Jesus basically was saying, and that's the other thing we're asking today, is basically this. When you make an oath or you swear something, is it because you have to convince somebody else that you're going to keep your word? Scripture goes on, Matthew 5.37 says, Let your yes be yes and your no be no, for whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Let your yes be yes and your no be no, and anything more than that is from the evil one. Now, a lot of people freak out over that term, evil one. So, so if you make a promise or you're saying something you know you're going to keep, that's just Satan talking through you. It's just Satan it's not really you, it's Satan. The devil made you do it. Uh, no. Let's look at that for a minute. I always go back to the Greek. Let's see what it says. Evil one there. Well, there's two words, two main words, Greek words used in Scripture for Satan. One of them, you'll recognize this one, is Diablos. Y'all thought that was Spanish, didn't you? El Diablo, Diablos. It's not Spanish. Diablos is Greek, and it means devil. Or the other Greek word used is Satanus. Satanist, naming specifically Satan, okay? At the end of verse 37, the word evil one there, it's not 
diablos. It's not satanus. It's a Greek word, paneus. Paneus. And it just means evil. But here's the definition. Paneus means bad, of a bad nature or condition, in a physical sense, diseased or blind, in an ethical view, evil, wicked, bad. What Paneus is talking about is, it's not talking about Satan, it's talking about us. It's talking about us personally. Remember last week we talked about, in the Revertigo, how, you know, you've, you used to be one way, and then you've kind of grown and you're trying to change, and now you've, as a Christian, you put on this new person, and when you revert and you get around people, you've got to revert back to the evil or the bad things that you used to do. That's what this is referring to. When you make a promise, if, if you have to swear because you can't keep your word, that's more or less, is from the evil one. That's talking about, that's from your old sinful self. That's from that old sin nature. It's from you. You can't blame anybody else but yourself. The evil one. It's not talking about Satan. It's talking about us. Now, I hear kids all the time. I remember growing up. How many times kids, you heard somebody go, you know, hey, I, I, you know, last week I, I ate five hamburgers. You ate five hamburgers? No, you, I, did. I did. I went to Burger King. I ate five hamburgers. No, you did. I did too. I swear to God I did. I swear to God. Yeah, I took my bike and I jumped it like all the way over the street from one way to driveway to another. No, I didn't. Yes, I did. I swear to God I did. Do it again. Oh, I can't. My tire's flat. Ugh. But we hear kids say that all the time. As adults, we do that too. Think about it. How many times, you know, hey, man, I'm going to help you. Oh, I'll, man, I'll be there to help you. Man, you know, last time you told me you, you were going to be there, you blew it. I mean, you, you didn't show. No, man, I will be there. This time. I swear to God I'll be there, man. I swear, I swear to God, you'll see me. I, I, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll be there. You know what it said when you have to say that? Like I said, why are you swearing? Who are you trying to convince? The other person or yourself? Because when you have to swear to God, when you have to make a promise, basically what you're saying is, is in essence, you're saying this. I'm going to mark off this area that I just talked about to you as absolute truth, okay? This little thing I just told you, this is absolute truth. Because everything else that I tell you, you know, is a crock. And because I don't keep my word and I'm untrustworthy, I'm going to have to make this swear to you that I'm going to do what I said I'm going to do this time. That's what we do. I love this quote by J. Vernon McGee. He says, when a man says to me, I'd swear on a stack of Bibles a mile high, that fellow I do not believe because I think, he is, I think the lie he is telling me is a mile high. I'm serious. Anytime anybody tells me, man, I swear on a stack of Bibles. You know what that tells me? That tells me you're full of it. Straight up. If you have to try to convince me that your word is good, then that tells me your word's not good. And you know your word isn't good. And that frustrates people. And you've all been in those situations when that happens. You know, I've had people that, you know, a few weeks ago, well, about a few months ago, had an individual that basically came in, hadn't seen him for a while, came in, told him a bunch of junk stuff going on. Man, I need to talk to you. I'm ready to get myself straight. I'm ready to get myself right. I said, great. That's awesome. He said, you have to, can we meet this week? I'm like, I'm swamped this week, but I can probably squeeze you in someplace. Or, well, lunch. Can we do lunch? You got to eat. You got to eat. You, we can do lunch. I said, okay, how about Thursday? Thursday. Okay, great. Thursday. We'll do lunch. I said, great. So, text him during the week. Hey, looking for lunch on Thursday. Yeah, see you then. Okay. Got to the restaurant on Thursday, 11.50. 12 o'clock, 12.15. Hey, man, you on your way? 12.30. Dude, I'm about to order. Where are you? 12.40. Call. Voicemail. Nothing. Fine. I ate lunch by myself. Wasted an hour and a half of my day that I really couldn't waste. Eight months later, I run into the guy at Hastings. I'm like, dude, where are you? What? Oh, I don't lunch? Remember this dirt, 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 dirt? Phone, here, text, see? Oh, dude, I, I'm sorry, something came up. Really? Something came up. Couldn't call, couldn't phone, couldn't respond to text, couldn't call me the day after and apologize, tell me what you want. No. Okay. He said, so, um, can you do lunch next week? Yeah. No. I'm busy. You got to eat. I said, I already ate eight months ago. Can you talk now? No, I don't have time to talk now. Okay, well then, catch me sometime here again. Done. 
It's so frustrating when people waste your time like that. The point is, our words should always be reliable. Yes means yes, no means no. My dad used to have a saying. He was a football coach. Don't, write, don't let your mouth write checks your body can't cash. Don't make promises you can't keep. Now, I'm going to step on toes here big time because I'm going, to, I'm going to bring this home a little bit in the context of where we're at. For some reason, church is the one, really the one place that so many people volunteer for things and don't show, make promises and don't keep them. When we were fixing the building, we were fixing the building or whatever, and I had several groups of people, you know, we were doing stuff, but we were working like weeknights and weekends and stuff. I said, I have several group of people come and say, hey, man, hey, hey, um, I can get some guys together. We can come paint the building. W- w- like during the week, man, can you let us in? If you let us in during the week, we can come in here, man. We can knock out this wall and we can take care of this. I'm like, really? Yeah, I'm going to get some guys. We can come do this. Are you sure? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's great. I said, okay. So when you, oh, noon, be noon on Tuesday, noon on Tuesday, great. Me and Skip came up here, opened the building at noon on Tuesday. At 1.30, we left the building, never saw them. Wasted an hour and a half of our time. Over and over again. We had some work days a few weeks ago. I didn't look at the list. We had sign-up sheets. On the Thursday, like eight people signed up to come up here and help. On the following Saturday, or vice versa, like ten people signed to show up and help. Out of the ten people that signed up for Saturday, two showed up. Out of the eight people that signed up for the Thursday night, one showed up. Now, I didn't have the list, and I honestly didn't want to see the list because I'd have been making phone calls. But when people, and, you, and you've been in this situation where you're counting on people, you're depending on people to show up, and they tell you, I'll be there, I'm going to show up, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this, you, I got your back. And then they don't show. How frustrating is that? Then you don't do it to somebody else. Treat others as you would have them treat you. Around the church, there's no unimportant jobs. There's no unimportant jobs here. And every Sunday morning, we have hospitality people and greeters and children's workers and techs and musicians. And, and there's no unimportant job in the church. And when you say you're going to be there, other people depend that you're going to be there. If you're going to greet, we're depending on you to be there to greet. Greeters, they're not just people that shake hands. When we got new people, and some of you visitors know this, greeters, they come, they point you out, oh, you have children, let me take you here. Let me introduce you to Lauren. Lauren, let me take you here. If we've got one person doing that when we should have had four, while they're doing that, other people are coming in and don't know where they're going. Greeters, it's not just about shaking hands. And so many times in the church, we do a job and we think, well, I'm not the pastor. I'm not the music guy. I don't do this. I'm not that important. There are no unimportant jobs because every spot in the church is a connection point for somebody. And if you're not there to connect, if, you're, if you said you were going to greet, you don't show. If you said you were going to volunteer for the kids and, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I drank too much last night. Oh, I'm sorry, I... I decided to go into work. Oh, I'm sorry. And you don't call, you don't show? That's bogus, people. You wouldn't like it if you were the one left hanging. So don't leave anybody hanging. Be responsible. Step up. Do what you say you're going to do. Because I asked somebody one time that just, oh, you know, I just, I got busy. So I got busy. Said, on Monday morning, have you ever just not showed up for work? Well, no, I get fired. Okay. So you, you promised your job, your employer, that you'd be there, whatever they pay. I, I get that. I said, so basically, you didn't really promise me or Skip or Lauren or Steve or, 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 or Marv that you'd be here. You made a promise to God. I mean, this is God's house, God's church. And basically, by saying, I'll be there to do this, you kind of made a promise to God. So why is it that we walk away from our promises to God so easy? Just because it's church. James 5.12 says, But of above all, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth. And this is James, Jesus' brother, writing in a completely different spot in Scripture. Do not swear by either heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under judgment. Now the word judgment here, it's hupokrites. 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 What word does that sound like? Hypocrisy, hypocrite. What is a hypocrite? It's somebody that says one thing and 
If you say you're going to be someplace or help somebody or do something and do another, you are a hypocrites. That's what this word did. Do not fall under judgment. It means an answering or an answer. You're answering to somebody. The act of a single player, you're acting. You're acting like you're going to be there. You're acting like you're going to do this. And then you don't show. Hypocrisy. The judgment in this verse, it's talking about not a spiritual judgment, but a judgment of you personally, of your reputation, of your character. If you constantly tell people you're going to be, oh, I'll be there, I'll do this, I'll see you there, and you don't show up, you get a bad reputation. And the funny thing is, when you call people like the, to do that on that, they get upset. I had a guy at this one church I was at. I was, I was like a couple small group pastor, the huge church, ran 13,000 people a weekend. I had more small group leaders than most churches in this town have people in them. It was, it was insane, the amount of people. And we had a, an event that we were doing, a big small group rally, and there was this area, somebody needed somebody to oversee this area of the children's, the jumpies and the bouncies and all this. And this one guy said, hey, and I need somebody to do this. And this one guy raised his hand. I don't know exactly who he was. He'd volunteered for about six things with us and no, no showed every time. And so I basically just looked past him. I was just like, okay, can anybody, can anybody do it? And he's there. And I'm just looking right past him. And finally, one of my division leaders, a guy that, man, I mean, you could, he was gold. You know, he, he would be there for stuff he didn't even promise he would be there for. He was that good. And I went, oh, top, you got it. All right, you got this? Good, I'll get you the list of this. Okay, great. Well, afterwards, the guy came up to me and said, dude, you just left me hanging. I'm like, what? He said, you left me hanging. I was staring with my hand up. You left me hanging. I said, kind of like the six other times you've left us hanging? Well, but, 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 but. I'm like, no, no, no. Okay. This day you didn't show up. You volunteered for this, you didn't show up. You volunteered for this, you volunteered for this, you didn't show up. I said, would you have rather let me hang in or would you have rather me look down at you in the front row and gone, gone hey, Fred, the last six times you did this, you know showed us and cost us, so I'm not giving it to you. I'm letting somebody else do it. I said, would that have been better? And he started to get mad. I'm like, look, tell me where I'm wrong. If, if I am wrong, if I'm, if I'm wrong about those times, I will, I will stand up in front of everybody at the next meeting and apologize. Tell me where I'm wrong. And he kind of looked at me and said, I can't. I said, exactly. I said, your reputation is a no-show. You have the reputation of you say you're going to do great things and you don't show up. Nobody believes you. He goes, but I swear to God, next time I will. And I just kind of looked at him and he goes, I'm doing it again. I said, yeah, you are. I said, don't prove it to me. Prove it to me. I said, volunteer at that thing. Just show up there. Just vol I will be there. I said, I'll see you when I see you. I didn't see him. And that was his reputation. That's what it's talking about in 512. The judgment. If you constantly say you're going to do something, you don't do it. People don't believe you. They don't trust you. And that's the last thing is basically this. Think before you make a commitment. That's the problem with the text is yes. We just... We just blurt out commitments. We just make commitments. And there's two reasons we break our word. First is flat out, I'm going to be honest, it's selfishness. We get a better offer. Dude, man, I need, hey, hey, I need your truck. Can you come help me move this weekend? It's real important. Can you help me? Dude, I will be there, no problem. Friday, Friday, I will be there Friday. Friday, no show. A couple days there. Dude, where were you? Um, um, well, Tom called Thursday night and I went dove hunting but you promised me you would be there. Yeah, I know, man, but I don't get to go dove hunting that much. So basically, you just got a better offer. We do that all the time. We will make a word, we'll say this, and we, where we have every intention of doing it unless a better offer comes up. Selfishness. The second thing, though, the main reason we break our word is, and this is where most of us lie, we can't say no. It's good intentions. But we don't want to let people down. We don't want to hurt feelings. And so we have a hard time when somebody says, hey, man, can you do this? We have a hard time saying, you know what? No, I can't. I mean, I'm, I'm swamped. I got this. I got that. I can't. Because we don't like to let people down. And, and it looks like we don't care. And it looks like we're, we, we, we're indifferent. When, in fact, it's worse if you say yes and then no-show somebody because they're counting on you. They're counting on you to do what you said you were going to do. And I think sometimes we say, yeah, and this is, I'm going to be honest, this is my biggest struggle right here. It's, it's not that I don't want to let people down. It's that I'm so busy. I got so much junk going on. 
And if you, you can ask my wife, you can ask my friends. I, can, I am not an organized person. My mind doesn't work like that. And somebody will say something to me, like, hey, man, this Thursday, can you be here at 3 o'clock? Because I need to, like, you know what? Yeah, oh, can you need me to show up and do an opening prayer for you at 3 o'clock for this event? Sure, I, man, I can be there. And I'll go home, and I'll be talking to Molly, and I'll be going, hey, yeah, uh, Thursday, by the way, I've got this at 3. And she goes, okay, how are you going to be there at 3 when you have this at, when you've got to be here at 1, and then you've got to do this at 2.30? And how are you going to get from this meeting at 2.30 to be over here at 3 o'clock across town to do this? I'm just like, ah, oh, dang it. Because now I've either got to kill myself to get other stuff to be where I'm going to be, or I've got to make some phone calls and tell somebody, you know what? I know I said I could be there. I goofed. I messed up. I had another commitment I forgot about. Um, can you please forgive me? Do you have somebody else? What can we, you know, I could be there by the, you know, and most people appreciate that, but it is the hardest thing. I've discovered it's easier for me to say no than it is for me to call back and have to say no at a later date and apologize for it. But we get so busy. But we've got to learn to say no. If, if we've made a commitment to somebody, we've got to say no someplace else. I had one recently, and it killed me. A while back, Marv uh, called me and said, hey, I was taking a client out. I had two clients. I was taking out fishing, and one of them called and canceled. So Friday, you want to go fishing? And I was just like, mm, I can't. Oh, I want you so bad, but I've got this, and I promised Molly this, and I promised I'd take Kaylee here and do this. And so, man, I just, oh, I want you so bad, but... No, man, I can't. I can't do it. I, I told my wife and my kids we were going to do something else. I love my wife and kids, but man, that sounded like fun. But the hardest thing in the world is to say no. You've got to do it. Learn how to say no. Quit giving everybody the text is yes. I love this quote by Pythagoras, Greek philosopher, six centuries before Christ. If you're a math teacher, you know the Pythagorean theorem. I can say it. I think I know what it is. Helen, I'm not going to try because then you'll correct me. Um, but it's, he said this, let one's word carry such conviction that one not need call deities to witness. Be a person whose word is so good that you don't have to swear to God you'll be there that you don't have to make a promise that you will do what you say you will do. And that's the renegade challenge this week. You've got to look at ourselves and say, look, honestly, what would others say about your word, your reputation? Seriously, if, if you said, if you're in a group of people and you said, I'll be there, and you walked away, would those people go, yeah, oh yeah, we, we, we got this done. Or when you walked away, would they go, okay, who else do we need to sign up for this because we know 90% chance they're not going to make it? What's our, they said they were going to do it. Yeah, what's our backup plan? What would others say about you, your word, and your reputation? And here's the challenge. If you say you will do something, do you follow through? If you say you're going to do it, do you do it? Psalm 141.3 says, Set guard, O Lord. Set guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. God, watch the words I speak. Help me be truthful. Help me think before they come out of my mouth. I talked to you at the beginning. I told you a story about Andrew Garcia, who borrowed basically in today's world $3,000 worth of goods from a merchant in Bozeman, Montana on a handshake. As the trapping season came to an end, Winter started coming. A group of hostile Crow and Sioux Indians basically set up camp between where he was and the town of Bozeman, Montana. And while he was trying to figure out his way back, a, a late, you know, an early, early storm, what late, early, whatever, storm came in, completely unexpected, mini blizzard. So he's got to fight through Indians. He's got to fight through this storm. And his other fellow trappers are saying, man, Andrew, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I mean, you're going to kill yourself trying to repay this debt. And Andrew said, no, you don't understand. I gave that man my word. He struggled through the blizzard. He snuck and fought his way through the Indians. Battered, beat up, bloodied. He walked back into that merchant shop. 
and handed him the stack of pelts to repay that debt because Andrew was a man of his word. His yes was yes, his no was no. He did what he said he was going to do. My challenge to you this week is, can that be said of you? And if not, what do you need to do now to correct that so that you have a good reputation, a good standing, a good judgment from your peers and your friends? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. <clears throat> we thank you for hard messages, and I thank you the way you step on my toes personally. Because if I'm reading your word and I don't feel a little pressure, then I'm probably not really reading it. Father, this week, I ask that you would help each and every one of us. Help your Holy Spirit prod us and remind us, Matthew 5, 37, to make our yes be yes and our no be no. To not tell people we're going to do something if we're not going to do it. And if we tell someone we're going to do something, to tell everybody else no so that we can be keepers of our work. Father, we thank you just for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. Because the truth of the matter is, the scripture says, we are the evil ones. We cannot do that in our own power. Paul makes it clear over and over again that we do what we don't want to do and we don't do the things that we do want to do. But through the power of your son, Jesus Christ, we have the power to let our yes be yes and our no be no, to be people of our word. And Father, today, if there's anybody here that that whole thing about Jesus, Jesus, knowing Jesus, might be going, okay, I've heard of Jesus, but I don't know if I have a relationship with Jesus. Because there's a difference between knowing Jesus and having a relationship with him. It's the difference between knowing who the President of the United States is and having his cell number that he'll pick up. And if you want to have that relationship with Jesus, it's as simple as asking. Just saying, Father, and I know I'm a sinner. I know I goof up. I don't keep my word. I don't do the things I want to do. I know I should be a better person, and I can't seem to get there. But today I'm going to trust that your gift on the cross, that you sent your son, Christ, Jesus Christ, to die for my sins, to pay my penalty for all the times I mess up. And I know he's good to his word. But he said, whoever believes in me shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The Father, today, I'm trusting and accepting your gift of Jesus Christ. Take away my sin. From this point forward, I'm going to do everything I can to live for him, to be a new person, to be better tomorrow than I am today. If you pray that prayer, don't keep it to yourself. Tell me, tell Skip, find Steve or Mar. Let one of us know. Put it on the car, drop it in the bucket so we can pray for you. For the rest of us, again, Father, Help us be the people that you have called us to be, the church you've called us to be. Help us honor our commitments and be a great witness for you. We thank you for this day, this time we've had. Look at your word. In your son's name we pray. Amen.